It's been called the lifeblood of the global economy, but over the past three years, the fixed income or bond market has been battered by low economic growth, sticky inflation, low investor confidence and high interest rates. A narrative of higher interest rates for longer sparked panic selling of U.S. government bonds by investors in October, with the 10-year Treasury yield touching 5% for the first time since 2007. But here's the question. Have we reached the bottom of the cycle? I'm Jeremy Maggs. This is No Ordinary Wednesday. It's an in-depth look at what is driving markets, shaping the economy, changing the game. The rapid rise in the 10-year Treasury yield means that the U.S. government has to pay more to borrow money for 10 years. And the ripple effects of that will be keenly felt globally. To explain what this means for investors and the world at large, we have with us Annelies Piers, Chief Investment Officer for Investec Bank Switzerland, and Owen Giwe Boy, Fixed Income Analyst at Investec Wealth and Investment South Africa. To both of you, a very warm welcome to No Ordinary Wednesday. So, Annelies, to you, first of all, we have a lot of listeners to this podcast who are new to the world of investing. So maybe just in simple terms, explain to me what the bond market is, why it's such an important cog in the global financial system, and why historically it's seen as one of the more safer investments. Thank you, Jeremy. So traditionally, you have different asset classes, cash being your lowest return, traditionally, and lowest risk The next step up, if you take a little bit more risk, you go to the bond market and there are different areas in the bond market. So if you were to lend to develop market governments, you take a little bit more risk and a little bit higher return. You can then also lend to corporates and the corporates have got more risk and more return, but you get treated a little bit better than an equity investor. And then equities are out on the, the furthest for higher risk, higher return. And interest rates have a big impact on the bond market. Um, The reason for that is cash, obviously, we all know what cash rates are worldwide, but the interest rate is the level. So if we look at one year, two year, three year, four year, five years, is the amount that you lend to the American government, for example. So if you think that growth is going very well or inflation is is going to increase, then obviously interest rates are going to increase and it means that it's more expensive for the U.S. government to borrow and you get a better interest rate. What we've had now has been quite a severe time, but we'll speak a little bit further on that. But as I say, interest rates is the determining factor that clears savings and investment. So it is the price of money. All right. So against that backdrop, and thank you for the explanation, in September, Britain saw outflows of an estimated £356 million from fixed income funds alone. So clearly, if I'm understanding you, this is not just an American problem. It's something perhaps we should all be concerned about, particularly given the recent sell-off of US bonds, and that would have a spillover effect as far as we're concerned, surely. Yes, what happened is, remember that in COVID, inflation was negative. So governments paid zero to borrow money and corporates paid nearly zero. So they would have paid a spread, say one or 2% to borrow money. Inflation came back with a vengeance after COVID because growth picked up because of all the stimulus packages. Then we had the big energy shock that came after the Ukraine war and then growth continued to increase. And on that background, inflation picked up. And because inflation picked up, nobody wanted to lend money to the American government, for example, at 0% anymore. So the price went up. We're charging the American government now 5% to borrow in the 10-year area. And that has had this big impact. And that is called the bear market in the bonds. And that is why you've had such a big outflow in bond markets across the world. And they've gone into equities because they felt that equities are going to give you a higher return. And equities is viewed as an inflation hedge. So if you grow well and inflation picks up nicely, that's when equities do well. It is only when inflation gets out of control that equities and bonds don't do well. So you use the phrase bear market, some commentators calling it the greatest bond bear market of all time. Is that over amplifying it? No. So about two months ago, it was the biggest bond bear market in 150 years when we went from zero interest rates to about four and a half. Now that we're closer to five, it is the biggest bond bear market in recorded history. And it is because interest rates went so quickly from zero to five percent. 
We have seen spikes like this that followed inflation spikes after the First World War, the Second World War, and in the 80s. The difference in the 80s is that the dollar devalued by 70%, and then we had the oil price shocks. And COVID was a war. It was a war against a virus. Just like a war, it stopped the economy. And now we're sitting a little bit with COVID fog because people are struggling to figure out what's happening in the economic numbers and the cycles. The cycles are a little bit out of whack following COVID. I want to push you a little bit further if I can on interest rates. So as you've said, interest rates have been a thorn in the side of the bond market. We've seen inflation peaking and in some respects meeting target expectations. But central bankers, Annalise, seem cautious and are keeping rates higher for now. So how are bond market investors then reacting to or should they be reacting to this news? So if we go back a year ago, Most people felt that growth is still holding up, but most forecasters forecasted a recession in 2023. What derailed this whole story is that Biden announced his stimulus packages this year, the CHIPS Act, the Transport Act. Now, traditionally, a government does not put stimulus into an economy when the economy is growing strongly like we've seen this year. So traditionally, you have stimulus packages coming out when you're in a recession to get the economy going again. Biden this year caught us all off guard by putting a stimulus package in when the economy was growing strongly. So what's happened is instead of us going into recession this year, we've avoided a 2023 recession. That has made the bond market go up even higher because traditionally the bond market looks at inflation, but they're now saying, yes, inflation is around 3%. The Fed target is 2%. It's in line to come to 2%, but if growth is this strong, inflation might pick up again. And that is what has caused this disconnect a little bit with bond investors and the risk assets, because risk assets are looking at growth at the moment. And the bond market, which traditionally looks at inflation, is also looking at growth and saying, hey, wait a minute, maybe growth continues to be strong. I'm skeptical because I do think that this interest rate or this this fiscal package is going to come out of the system. And then we will go back to trend growth in America. If we look at GDP now in America, Right now, it's running at 4.9%. Trend growth in America is at roughly 1.5%. So we're way above trend growth. And that is what's keeping the bond market off balance and risk assets quite happy. So equity markets have continued to go up while the bonds have been in such a bear market. All right. Awangiwe, I want to bring you into the picture now. And let's roll this into South Africa and look at the domestic situation if we can. We know we have a sluggish economy. Uh, we have tight monetary policy. We have a weakening currency and structural issues. So how is the South African fixed income and credit market faring in that respect against that rather gloomy landscape? I think for South Africa, obviously, our South African financial market is mainly driven by US and the EU. What makes it slightly different is that we do have slightly different, you know, idiosyncratic risks. Those idiosyncratic risks being our energy crisis via ESCOM. We also have worsening performance from our logistics network, which is Transnet. And then, of course, similar to America, we also have a fiscal deficit and also our fiscal burden is quite significantly high. Not near term, but more in the longer term. And I think those factors really do contribute a lot to where we are seeing yields, both in the credit market. And when I talk about credit market, I see that as cash. I see that as also your normal banking bonds, etc., but also our 10-year bonds. And what we're basically seeing there is that there's definitely risk from the fact that there's monetary issues, but also there's a risk from an issuance perspective. So how that's played out in the last year, we've seen quite a significant steepening, specifically in our SA government bonds. And how that's basically played out is that we've seen a lot more interest in the fixed income market more than ever. If you look at where yields were about 10 15 years ago, yields were sitting around 6 7%, and now we're seeing yields north of 11%. So the market definitely is chasing more yield. And as a result of that, we've seen more local residents holding more bonds than offshore. We've seen a lot of sell-off from the offshore guys. And I think that's also off the back of more risk from the debt perspective, more risk from a GDP perspective, and I guess also a risk in terms of what is South Africa going to look like in the next five to 10 years. A lot of the market doesn't really have a clear view of that. So what we've seen that fixed income 
pretty much didn't do well last year just because of the fact that there was so much sell-off similar to the US. And also what we've seen is that bonds pretty much spiked quite significantly. We've seen those bonds come in quite a bit this year off of the back of ESCOM reducing load shedding. We've seen more commodity companies going off the grid, more big corporates going off the grid, adding a bit more to the GDP of the country. Obviously, there's still issues on the revenue tax line, which is still a bit of an issue because we going to see more than expected issuances in the local bond market. Also, off the back of that, because of these concerns, we are also seeing issuances higher than ever. Previously, when you were issuing about five, six years ago, it was at relatively low rates, just like in the US. But what we've seen in South Africa is those rates have gone up. So off the back of that, we're seeing high issuances at higher rates, adding more risk to the South African deficit. And what we're seeing is that the National Treasury is looking at how they're issuing currently. So we've seen that they've started their maturities. They've started doing more long dated and short dated and, and more middle dated versus their previous strategy was to issue a more long dated. So I think National Treasury is, is coming to the forefront in terms of being more strategic in that aspect. I think in terms of the fixed income market, we've seen wider yields. We're probably going to see these yields at elevated levels until we see, I guess, a better understanding of how monetary policy is going to look like in South Africa. I think we've reached our peak in terms terms of our rates and we'll probably start cutting mid next year, which will probably be more beneficial. So we'll probably see better performance in the fixed income market. But yeah, I think a lot of it, like I've said, is mainly driven from the US and the EU. So I guess unless we get more colour from that, I think it's going to be quite hard to kind of see what that's going to look like in the foreseeable future. So let me widen the scope very slightly then. We're not the only developing economy in the world that has difficulties or challenged. Uh, There are also challenges in developed nations as well. But we've seen a rally in emerging market bonds this year. Could you explain that to me? And is that a conundrum? I think before we even talk about the rallying aspect of it, I think let's take a step back to, you know, what happened last year in the EM markets, right? You had rapidly rising global interest rates. You had a strong dollar. You had rising food and rising energy costs. And as a result of that, you saw a massive sell-off in hard currency. Basically, if you were an investor in EM, you lost a lot of money. What's happened this year is that now that EMs, you know, I think EMs were one of the first markets to hike rate quite significantly. And I think a lot of those countries have started to reach their peak, similar to South Africa. That's the one aspect. What we've also seen is that they were pretty much coming off a very low discount. So on average last year, we saw a lot of these bonds trading at about 50 to 60 and now trading about 70, 80. So we've seen quite a significant jump in terms of returns. I think on average, it was about 27% in EMs. And what we've also seen is that entities like IMF have almost stepped up to help a lot of these sovereigns in terms of workout plans or restructuring which has given investors who are holding EM bonds a lot more comfort that they can get some sort of cash out of these workouts. So I think if you almost put that in a bowl and mix that up, you almost, if you were holding them last year versus holding them this year, you were definitely going to get better performance from a yield perspective. Also the fact that the credit looks a little bit better. If you look at how distressed sovereign sector has performed, they've performed quite significantly well. And then when I talk about distressed, I talk about sovereign entities that basically have a yield of about a thousand basis points above US Treasury. So that's currently where sovereigns tend to price. And those as a sector have performed relatively well and them breaching their peak rates also has contributed to that. And I think they're probably going to continue doing well until the end of this year. I think Again, when America coughs, the whole world catches a flu. It also depends on what's going to happen with America, right? And as, you know, Annalisa so eloquently put it, is the disjointness in the inflation rate and also the dollar and how that's impacted the rest of the world. I think we're still going to feel that. And I think going forward, we're still going to see that impact. But yeah, I think that's the main drivers of of EM. And I think it is a conundrum, right? Because when we talk about distressed, Distress is not a, a good term because it means that there is a lot of pressure on that sovereign in terms of swelling debt, right? Or swelling fiscal. So it also does at the back of our heads, there is a little bit of, I guess, trouble brewing in the sense that in the next year or two, you know, are those sovereigns going to be able to pay for the debt that they have on their fiscal? And I think that's a critical question that the fixed income world needs to almost look at. Yeah. And let, let's not forget an election year in the United States in 2024 as well. 
We are going to continue this conversation in just a moment. I would just like to remind you that a new episode of No Ordinary Wednesday drops every fortnight. Please don't miss it. All you need to do is subscribe to Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the channel, please take a moment to rate us. Uh, Annelies, back to you then. Let's get into government debt. It poses a real threat to the bond market. Sovereign debt is high, continues to climb higher across the globe. We should be concerned shouldn't we? Yes, we should, because if we look at every time interest rates increased so sharply, as I said, from nearly zero to um, 5% in the US, we peaked at about 2% in Europe, the Fed breaks something. And as I said, with Biden spending suddenly in a very out of the normal cycle, for geopolitical reasons, it means that this really strong hike in interest rates makes me worry that If growth hits an air pocket, that risk assets will sell off significantly. Um, And we haven't seen that just yet. The other worrying thing is that the interest repayments from the the U.S. government, for example, they have to issue more debt and their spending on interest payments will very soon be one of the biggest parts of their spending. At the same time, their tax revenue has also dropped because of financial markets. So capital gains tax in America has dropped away, so their revenue has fallen away. And if you were to have higher inflation or growth too high, it means that interest rates stay higher for longer, which will put a lot of pain, I think, straight across the world. Because we are seeing strong dollar, oil price have picked up and interest rates are high, the growth tax that is basically created by those three factors, it's getting to dangerous levels. And Awangiwe, in South Africa, our debt is no better. And obviously, this is uh, of concern to the local market, no doubt. hundred percent. And I think just almost echo exactly what Annalisa said, is that already we have a massive fiscal deficit and a fiscal budget and, you know, a lot of debt on our balance sheet. If you think about our maturities in the next five years, we have about 1.7 trillion, which I think the market's not necessarily worried about. I think where we're worried about is how does that outlook look like after five, six years? And we almost see that translated within our 10-year South African government bond, right? That's the first thing. And then you also look at the fact that when the government is actually issuing out these bonds, they're issuing them at higher than ever interest rate percentages. And so similar to what I said before and similar to what Anadilisa said, you know, previously we were issuing at lower levels or lower interest rate levels, and now it's higher than ever. So it also that adds another span it to the works in terms of how the national treasury balance sheet is going to look like. So I think the market is very much concerned, not so much in the short term, more in the long term. But I think the more important question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we getting compensated? I think we are getting compensated. If you look at the fact that 10 years pricing at about 11%, you probably would factor in about a 3 4% being issuance premium and also an issuance premium in terms of the actual risk you're taking on SA Gavi. That's why the fixed income or specific in South Africa and why the local market does like the government bond because of the fact that it feels like you are being compensated for the risk that you're getting or rather that you're taking on. But yes, I think fundamentally we are very much concerned of what South Africa is going to look like in the next five years and if we can sustain the amount of debt because similar to what Annalisa said, tax revenue, we haven't met the budget. So we've started issuing more T-bills. We've started issuing more nominals. Unfortunately, our nominals are at a higher than ever discount. So now we're trying to issue some cook bonds, could be cheaper. So I think National Treasury is definitely aware of it. We're seeing how that's playing out in the market in terms of how they're responding to that, where I think is was quite good. But I do think in the fixed income world, the fact that so many people are lapping up these bonds even more than ever is you're being paid for the risk People understand the risk a lot better. And I think a lot of the people, a lot of investors are comfortable with the risk in itself. Annelies, let me try and find a silver lining here then. Um, You said that bond yields at a record high as a result of the high interest rates. We've discussed that in some detail. This, though, has worked out for investors as, as drivers of returns, hasn't it? It's worked out for equity investors because you've had growth with inflation falling, remember US inflation was at 9%, running at about 3.2%. So equity investors have had a Goldilocks environment, very good mix, growth and immaculate deflation or disinflation. What is going to be interesting now is that the silver lining is that I do believe inflation is going to come down further. I think the tight labor market in the US will ease. And if you see growth numbers softening a little bit, the bond market will start rallying. So it means you're going to have very good returns 
for a lot less risk relative to what we've had in the past. So I think buying treasuries at 5% for any investor is a very easy way to lock in really good interest rates, first of all. And I do think trend growth in America has not picked up. To me, when we get through this COVID fog, we are going to see that American trend growth is still running at about 1.5%, not at the 4.9% we are seeing right now. And all that is really good news for the bond market, which means that investors can take a little bit of profit in the equities that have run very well, and they can just take a little bit of profit and put it into a less risky investment and earn a very good return. So, Awangiwe, looking ahead to the post-hiking cycle, as you alluded to earlier, um, where do you see opportunity? First, just to mention a few things, we have the monetary budget speech in November. Um, I don't think there's much consensus in terms of what's happening with ESCOM, but I think the market at the moment is quite comfortable where ESCOM is in terms of performance. Uh, I mean, we've seen in the last two weeks, two other power plants have come back um, into play, Kusila 1 and 2, which has added more power back onto the grid. Um, like I said earlier on, a lot of commodity corporates, uh, retail corporates are going off the grid themselves. So adding more in terms of tax revenue, in terms of GDP, there's good outlook there. I think also we have an election next year, which is also quite critical in terms of, you know, how you're going to view South Africa in terms of is it still considered a safe haven as a sovereign? But I think for me, fundamentally, we have to look at what is market sentiment and how does that market sentiment play out in the bond world? I think from a inflation point of view, we'll probably get inflation down a bit further. We'll probably see GDP go slightly higher. We'll probably see the czar probably still stay within the 19 or 1850, 90 space. I think as a result of that, we'll probably see a lot of opportunities still within the fixed income space. I think at the moment, rates off of the back of what's happening in the idiosyncratic risk, I think rates will still be high and bonds will still be high, but I think they'll start coming in by the end of next year. So like you can capture a little bit of mark to market gains there. And the other part of the credit world, credit has been pretty much a safe haven in South Africa for a while. We do have great banks that have been resilient through COVID and through the last year in terms of what you've seen on their balance sheets from a capital liquidity perspective. So even holding normal senior and secured debt bonds, holding banking bonds can still give you relatively good returns. But I think where you're going to probably see good performance within the fixed income world is probably holding 10-year SA government bonds. That's probably where you'll get as much yield as you can within the fixed income context. And yeah, that's probably where I view it in the next year or so. So Annalise, I'm sure that you'll concur with that then, but what risks would there be that could derail more positive expectations? On the fixed income market, I think we've had three-year bear markets. So actually, the risks for me are skewed on yields coming down and people don't have enough bonds. What could derail the, that yields go up a little bit further in the US is if this war in the Middle East intensifies and the oil price spikes. My counter trend to that is that OPEC, in a way, in my point of view, has lost a little bit of control of the oil price. Yes, they can set it, but Russia is providing cheap oil to the rest of the world. So Iran has been selling cheap oil to China and India, and um, Russia will continue to sell at even cheaper levels because nobody is buying from them. So I think that oil price shock at the time when growth might be slowing down can give us a bit of an air pocket. But as I said, all of that is good news for bonds. If growth in America continue to surprise on the upside, but that means that growth rate has to maintain the 4.9% we're at now in the third quarter. If they can carry that into the fourth quarter, that could be a risk for the bond market. Awangiwe, we can't have this conversation and we, we are coming to the end of it without touching on an outlook for currencies. As you've both said, uh, an important player within the fixed income market. Do you have a view on emerging market currencies like ours, for instance, in the next couple of months? So you did allude to it. Maybe you could just amplify that for me. I always say anyone who can predict how currency is going to look like in the six months should make it a full-time job because anyone who can do that is incredible. I think at the moment, you know, USDs are still sitting and hovering around the 19 rand level. 
I think it's probably going to stay at that level just because of the fact that, you know, local weak fundamentals will continue and they're not short-term issues that we have. These are pretty much prolonged long-term issues that we have within the South African context that still need to be rectified. So I think the next six months will still have high levels or rather the currency will still be at a high level where we'll probably see it go down is probably at the end of next year, 2024, early 2025, where it could potentially go back to 17. And that would probably be driven by the fact that probably have more colour on where the oil price is, on inflation. And obviously, from a political point of view, we'll have more understanding of how the offshore market views um, SA as a sovereign. So until then, I think there's not much colour to almost convince me that the currency will get stronger. It will be still significantly quite weak. And Annalise, final word to you then, what about the major currencies? So the dollar has been in a bull market since 2008. Up until 2008, it was actually in a 10-year bear market compared to its, you know, the trade-weighted currencies, mainly Europe. If we look at purchasing power parity, now purchasing power parity is how much you pay for a hamburger in South Africa versus buying a hamburger in America. If you were to value that, and purchasing power parity doesn't impact a currency today. It does play out over four or five years. Now, if we look at purchasing power parity, the U.S. is 20% overvalued, the euro is 20% undervalued, and the yen is 44% undervalued. So it makes yen the cheapest currency at this point in time in the developed market world. Not, I'm not talking about emerging markets. So it really depends on what happens next year. If we were to have a hard landing, a deep recession next year, the dollar will increase for safe haven status even though it is already expensive. The yen will also do very well in safe haven. However, if we have a mild, mild recession and a little soft, little blip or air pocket, I do think that the dollar will trade sideways and it might even surprise everybody and weaken because as you mentioned earlier, we are going to have an election year and I think it's going to be a very messy election year next year. You have a very big split between the Democrats and the Republicans and I think it's going to be a dirty fight and that unfortunately is not good for risk markets. So once again, it points me to put some insurance in your portfolio be a little bit risk off. And as I said, for me, the dollar longer term is overvalued, but we might see a little bit of strength still coming through next year. I'm going to thank both of you for a very insightful conversation. Annelies Piers, Chief Investment Officer, Investec Bank Switzerland, along with Awungiwe Boy, Fixed Income Analyst at Investec Wealth and Investment South Africa. To both of you, thank you for joining me on No Ordinary Wednesday. And just to remind you, a new episode of No Ordinary Wednesday drops every fortnight. To ensure that you don't miss a show, follow Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the channel, please take a moment to rate us. Until next time, from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire Focus Radio team, goodbye and thank you for listening. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long-term insurer.